Hi there and welcome to chapter 3.3 of Stevens' Matrices, Vectors, and 3D Math. In this chapter we're going to talk about projectiles. And when I mean, when I say a projectile, I mean an object that is moving through 2D or 3D under no forces other than that of gravity. So you, you launch it and then you do nothing. You watch it fall or bounce or things like that. So specifically, I have some initial position and then I give it some initial motion, an initial velocity in some direction with some speed and then I want to track where it lands or how it gets there, right? How it travels through 2D or 3D. And the only force acting on it will be that force due to gravity. And in this little diagram, that force is denoted by A, is the acceleration function, or the acceleration vector valued function. Specifically, it's a vector valued function, meaning it, it has an X component and a Y component. The X component is zero, so there's no lateral motion left or right. All the motion is in the Y direction, and it's gonna be the negative Y direction. So that's known as the acceleration due to gravity, and you may or may not be familiar with it, um, but in the um, English system, it's 32 feet per second per second. So what that means is if you just drop something, let it go, after the first second, it'll be going, it'll have a velocity of 32 feet per second down. And if you wait another second, it'll be 64 feet per second down. And if you wait one more second, it will be um, 96 feet per second going down. But it's always, it's always being drawn down and it changes the velocity according to this constant acceleration. Right? That's what I mean by projectile. There's no other forces acting on it after it is released. Right, and we have some initial conditions on this situation. We have this angle of elevation, and that's the angle you're launching it. And that angle is generally taken from the positive x-axis. Call that theta. There is an initial velocity, which is just going to be the length of this vector. Right, how long is that vector? That'll be the initial velocity. It's also the speed. Right, and then we're going to have an initial height which is how far up on the y-axis I'm starting, I'm going to assume that the initial position in the x direction is zero. So wherever you're starting it on x, we'll call that zero. And then we'll have a height here. So its actual initial position, as denoted with the position vector valued function, is going to be zero and then the initial height. And then the initial velocity vector is going to be this vector actually right here that has length little v naught but it's going to be pointed in the direction associated with x, which is v naught times the cosine of this angle, and the y component, which is going to be v naught times the sine of this angle. So that's my initial velocity vector. Notice when you look at the magnitude of this velocity vector, it equals v naught as determined up here. All right? And then the acceleration, as I mentioned, is going to be constant. It's going to be given by this equation, right? Constant acceleration in the downward direction along the y-axis. <clears throat> okay, so we're actually not, I'm not even going to give you the position and vector valued functions for this um, projectile. We're actually going to derive them through straightforward integration, right? Specifically, if I start off with the acceleration and I integrate, I wind up with velocity, right? Because if I take velocity, and differentiate it, I get acceleration. So I'm just gonna now gonna go the other way through integrating the acceleration, and I'm gonna get velocity. Right. Okay, so all I need to do is look at my acceleration vector. It's a pretty easy vector. It's this one right here. When I integrate the zero, all I get is a constant. When I integrate the negative g, that's also that's just a, a number, right? So it's going to be negative g times t plus another constant. All right, so I call them c1 and c2, these constants. Now I can figure out c1 and c2 by looking at the initial velocity, which comes from right here. All right. So if you look at the initial velocity, if I plug in t equals 0 right here, that's 0. That means that's now gone. 
And so what that means is that C1 is just this x component of the initial velocity, and C2 is just this, the y component of the initial velocity. All right? So I got that, but now the official velocity function is a function of t. We can't forget that's right there, right? So we still have the negative gt plus the initial y component and then the x component of the velocity. So I now have my velocity function for all time. That's great. I figured it out. Now I do, in order to actually get numbers in here, I need an initial velocity, but that would come with the problem. Okay, so the next step is to play this exact same game, only get the position, right? This is velocity right here. I'm going to integrate that to give me the position function. I'm going to play the same game, only I'm going to recognize that my initial position is given here at time zero. All right, so we go to the next page. I'm going to integrate velocity, which is this function right here. And just like differentiation, I integrate it term by term. So this thing here, um, whenever I integrate it, is going to get a v naught cos theta times t. All right, that's just a constant times t plus some new constant. Right? And then whenever I integrate this term, that t goes to t squared over 2, but I still get the negative g out in front. So that goes to this, and then I get, that's just a constant, so it just gets a, a t thrown in front of it right there. And then another constant of integration. Now we, so now we have two more constants of integration. But again, those are determined from the initial conditions that we just pointed to earlier. So this is r of t in the general case. This is r of 0. So when I plug in 0 for t up here, that's gone, that's gone, that's gone. And what I have is that c3 equals 0, all right, because this has to equal c3. And then c4, which is the y component, has to be h. And so when I plug those back into my position function, right, c3 there, c4 there, I get my position for all time is given by that position function. And that's amazing. And that all I need to know is how it started, you know, how fast you sent it in what direction and where you started. And that all I have is one force acting down. I can get the position for all time, for all time, and that is pretty impressive. Um, now there is one little catch going on here. We're actually neglecting the um, the wind re or the air resistance, meaning that this constant acceleration, at some point or another, the air resistance, because that object has to go through air, will change this, and it won't. It, the acceleration will actually start to diminish, and so the velocity won't continue to. Um, increase. But for shorter distances, the neglecting and the lower speeds, neglecting uh, the air resistance is, is pretty standard. And so we're going to stick with that. Okay, so position for all time. And there's some things we can do symbolically with this uh, position function. So let, let's take a look at it. I'm going to play around with this. And it's worth remembering, this is just a vector valued function. This is x of t, and this is y of t, this whole part right here. And think about it this way. This is x, that's sort of the distance, and y is the height. Right, so the x is a, I guess it's a directed distance in whatever direction you uh, shot this thing. And y is the height. Okay, so, and just to summarize, there it is right there. Right, so there's a few things you can do. You can without without even plugging numbers in. You can tell whenever this um, projectile hits the ground, because if you take this, that's the y, that's the height. If you set that equal to zero, that'll be when the height is zero. We certainly get um, what you do is you get a quadratic in t. There's a t squared. There's a t. There's a constant term. And so if you solve this quadratic in t, 
by setting it equal to zero, you get this value for t. And that is when it, and you can even see the quadratic formula in there, right? The opposite of b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac over 2. You can sort of see it sitting in there, right? Um, and the problem, the problem is you usually get 2, right? You get a plus or minus at this. But in one case, the minus is going back in time. All right. So for example, if you start here and you shoot a projectile that goes like this, it'll hit the ground at a positive time. But it also, and where in, in mathematics where t can go negative, there's also the chance that it'll hit the x-axis when t is negative, right? t less than 0. So we're actually tossing that one out. That's why we don't have the plus or minus in this formula. So that's when it hits the ground. And so basically you can say, all right, if I know when it hits the ground, then I'll know how far it goes. I'll just take when it hits the ground and stick it into my x function, x of t. And when I do that, I get the total distance, which is this mess here. That is pretty brutal. Um, and, and generally these things simplify once you actually have an initial angle and initial height and initial speed. You, you know, this stuff simplifies down to manageable numbers. Uh, this is the most general form, right? General form. Um, and then the other thing you can do is you can take that um, height function, right, y of t, and you can make, you can figure out when this thing hits its maximum height, right? If that's y of t, if you take y primed of t, set it equal to zero, and solve for t, what you get is this that I call t tilde. Basically, this is the derivative of the y function set it equal to zero, this is when the, when the projectile hits the maximum height. But that's just the time, right? It's not the actual maximum height. It's max height at t tilde. Right, and so then if you take t tilde and you stick it into the height function, which is just y, right, t tilde, stick it into the height function right there, and simplify, it actually simplifies pretty nice, you get the maximum height given by this. And so this is, a lot of times if you take physics, if you take non-calculus based physics, they'll just give you a bunch of these formulas like this. Um, so this page is sort of deriving all those formulas. So you can tell when it hits, where it hits, how high it goes, uh, when it hits its maximum height. Uh, there's a few other things, you can get the velocity on impact once you get the velocity function, which you know what it is already because we derived it. Um, or you can just differentiate the position. You can give me the velocity. We can tell the velocity when it hits and the how fast it hits. Right? Okay, so let's do a, um, an example. We're going to have a football that's kicked. Angle of 30 degrees. All right, that's 30 and 80 feet per second. Notice that's all I'm giving. 30 degrees, 80 feet per second. And you can tell I can tell you all about what happens to this football, right? Um, so what I need to do, if you go back and you gotta look at this function, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reference it and I'm, I'm not gonna point to it again. But it's this it's this thing right here. Alright. My initial velocity, this is gonna be 80. That'll be 30 degrees, um, which is pi over 6. The initial height, I believe, was kicked from the ground, right? Let me just check that. Uh, from the ground. So the initial height back here is 0. Again, 80, 30 degrees. And in this case, the problem gives it in, um, in non-metric form. It's the negative or g is 32 feet per second per second or in other words 32 feet per second squared but that's in the negative direction right so the acceleration due to gravity is just 32 right there the negative is right out in front of there notice if you ever use you know if you go to the internet and you look something else up it might give you that the acceleration is negative 32 uh, but in, in this formulation, the negative is, is out here. So if you're using negative 32, make sure you make that a plus, right? One way or the other, acceleration has to be operating in the downward direction with respect to the y-axis.
Okay, so I plug all those things in there, and um, that's and by, so that's all here. H, there's my initial height, angle, speed, and G. So when I plug all those things in, I get my position function that looks like this. All right, I plug in V naught theta H G, and when I simplify that, I get something that is not nearly so unpleasant. All right, it's 40 root 3t is the x direction, and notice that continually increases, and 40t minus 16t squared. Now it's worth pointing out that this is only valid for so long. All right, this is only valid until the ball hits the ground. And we have to stop, all right, it's no longer valid after that point. Because notice, this will keep going down, x will keep increasing linearly, y will keep going negative, but I need to know when to stop. And so that's why this very first formula that I have up here is the first thing I do. It gives me the domain, all right? It says, all right, this is all well and good. This, this function, this formula, this, this position vector is valid until it hits the ground. And whenever you simplify, and it's a mess, but whenever you simplify all that, um, it's only in the air for 2.5 seconds, and then it hits the ground right here. 2.5, stop. And so that's why it's one of the first things that I like to do. Because this position function doesn't make any sense beyond the, the point where it hits the ground. So that's why I start with when does the ball hit the ground, and then I go into where is the ball for all times. Okay, so there's my position for t going from 0 to 2.5 seconds. That determines where the ball is at all times. If you want the total distance traveled, right? what we can do, since we figured out when it hits the ground, right? it hits the ground at t equals 2.5, we just plug that into x. right? And when I say x, I mean the, the function of t that defines the x direction. Right, so I plug 2.5 into there. That gives me 40 root 3 times 2.5, or about 173 feet. So it means it hits here at about 173. All right, that's pretty good. Pretty big, pretty, pretty long kick. Um, okay, and then we can answer, you know, what's the maximum height? All right. Oh, and by the way, there's formulas for this on the previous page. There was a formula for the total distance. I'm going to scroll back there. Don't get dizzy. But the formula for the total distance is here. Now, that formula is brutal to work with. right? It happens when you take T star and plug it into the X component. But notice, the formula is not necessary. If I know where it is for all time, right? I know this is where the position for all time, and I know it hits the ground at t equals 2.5. All I have to do is put the 2.5 right there. You know, there's no need to go all the way back to that formula. right? x is the, the distance in the x-axis. This is when it hits the ground. Pluck that value of t into the x component, and you get it. Right? So that formula, while it may at first appear friendly and nice to have a formula, it's actually once, once you get this, you can get all, all those other things pretty, pretty easily, in fact, almost more easily. Um, so to get the maximum height, that's the, that's our next question here. Number number four says get the maximum height, and there's we did that symbolically, and the way we did that was we said all right, well this is the y of t, that's the height. If I take that and I and I differentiate it, the y primed of t that's going to be 40 minus 32 t, but I'm just going to take that height function. All right, differentiate it, and so that height, the, the change in height with respect to time, I'm going to set that equal to zero. That'll get me when it hits the top. So t is going to be 40 over 32. All right, and uh, if I take 40 over 32, and I just plug it into there, that will get me my maximum height. All right, and 
or so so that's one way of doing it by hand the other thing you do is use the maximum height function which we have back here maximum height right three point five so you can figure it out so this is what we just did right we just found t tilde and then we'll plug it right back into the height function or you can just use the maximum height formula Okay, so we got 40 over 32 was when it reaches its maximum height. All right, and what what is that? By the way, that's uh, five fourths or 1.25 seconds. All right, seconds. So if you take 1.25 or five fourths and plug that into here, you'll get 25 feet. All right. So that is the maximum height. In my little diagram here, the maximum height is 25. Um, now to get the velocity vector, so let's move on to the next question. What's the velocity vector when it hits the ground? All right. Well, I have to figure out when it hits the ground, but I've already done that. That was T star. And I have to get my velocity function. Right. So I'll go to my position function differentiate that position function. All right, so I get 40 root 3, 40 minus 32t. All right, so that's the velocity vector valued function. I stick in 2.5, that's when it hits the ground. That goes right there. And I get 40 root 3, negative 40. So that's the velocity vector valued function. Uh, when it hits, you know, so this thing went like this and it stopped right there. This vector, 40 root 3, negative 40, um, looks something like, you know, d, 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 and so my velocity vector looks like this. So that's the direction, and the size of this velocity vector is the speed. So I take this, square it, this, square it, add them together. I get 6,400. You got to do that in your calculator. Take the square root, you get 80 feet per second. So it hits the ground going 80 feet per second in this direction. All right? So we get two things out of that. We get the direction it's heading, how fast it's going. And notice all of this was obtained simply by differentiation, or not differentiation, but actually integration where we took a of t equals 0 comma negative g integrated twice to get a position function valid for all time. All right, so it doesn't take very much information to tell where this thing's going to be for all time. That's the beauty of projectiles. All right? I mean you do need some initial conditions such as these given here where it starts on the y-axis, the angle of elevation, the angle of where your uh, rocket blasts off or your ball is kicked, and the initial speed. And then um, whether you're using metric or not. Right. So this is the English system. The metric system is um, 9.8 meters per second squared. This book uses 32, just to be consistent. Um, but 9.8 is found in a lot of other books. Now, the reason 9.8 is good is because sometimes you go 9.8, and then if you just round that to 10, now you've got a number that's fun to work with. Uh, but in this book, we stick with 32, um, just out of tradition. And so that gives us our position function. In 2D, we get all sorts of things. Maximum height, distance, uh, velocity on impact, speed on impact. So I think that's good for one video. The next video we're going to do is a projectile in 3D. It is um, surprisingly similar. You just break up. It says that Z is now, you know, Z is now the height. That's what Y used to be. And now the, the distance part is composed of an X and a Y. But we'll save that for a video from now. I think we've had enough. Um, and I will see you whenever you open up and watch 3.3 part 2. Alright.